Hello, everybody. This is Lauren Hershey. I'm the senior pastor at Word of Life Church, and we hope this podcast blesses you and helps bring you closer to God. Enjoy today's message. Praise the Lord. Thinking about where we've been the last uh, few weeks, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 says this. Isaiah said, in the, king year, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I want you to hear this this morning. Your life will become a temple for those things that are high and lifted up in your soul. And so the, I'll say it again. Your life will become a temple for those things that are high and lifted up in your soul. Your soul is your reasoning. It's your emoting, your, your, the way you show emotion, the degree and the, the emotions that you show, your reasoning, your thinking, your emoting, and your deciding. Those things that are high and lifted up in those things your, will fill your life and will become glorified in your life Sometimes to your detriment, sometimes to your benefit. But what's in your soul is going to control your life. And so the last few weeks we've been talking about that. My heart's just been going out to you. I want you to catch that. You know, I've, I've, I care for your soul. And that's why last week we did a workshop in the afternoon, a story work workshop, uh, dealing with the things in your soul, in your life. And we started working on that. I don't want anybody to get stuck in the middle. don't want anybody to surface old things or, you know, bad things or stuff and then get stuck in grieving or, you know, all that. And so we want to follow through all the way to the end because the goal is for you to have freedom and joy in Christ. (laughs) Hallelujah. Get done with that stuff. Anybody ever else remodel your house like we did and in the middle of it think, oh my God, what have I done? (laughs) That's the way it was. You know, if I could say it that way, you know, midnight, Abby, our daughter was it and gradu- was going to graduate in May, and we decided to remodel the kitchen. And so we're at midnight one night, the, the refrigerators in the dining room, the cabinets are torn out, the walls torn out, and I'm thinking, what have I done? Well, we don't want any of you to get stuck in the middle. And so we want you coming all the way to freedom and joy. Can you all say joy? Joy in Christ. So this week, you know, those of you that were registered, you're going to be receiving an email with the link. I'm going to do some videos and he'll help walk you through those worksheets that we handed out. And so those of you that weren't here but are interested in that sort of thing, check out redinkrevival.com, Patrick Norris's website. Now, high and lifted up, high and lifted up. Uh, you know, this week or a few weeks ago, there was a news and a video that were put out from NASA. NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, they fired 10 months ago, they fired a projectile into outer space. They called it the double asteroid redirection test. And they fired something about the size of a short refrigerator, about four foot by four foot by just under four foot. They fired it 7 million miles into space. And their objective was to hit an asteroid that was, that was orbiting around another asteroid. Well, after 10 months and 7 million miles of travel at 14,000 miles an hour, their dart, I thought that was kind of cute, the double asteroid redirection test, they shot a dart. Seven billion miles into space. That dart hit its asteroid, Dimorphos. And it changed its orbit. Reduced its orbit by 32 minutes. It was tremendous success. We, they put out a video. It's a 39-second video. They took the last 10 minutes or so. They had a camera on board. So they compressed it. It was still shots. And they made a video out of it. It's a 39 seconds Could you turn your attention to the screen? This is awesome. You see the larger asteroid there, and then the little one on the right, that's Dimorphos. Traveling at 14,000 miles an hour. Oh, 
contact. <laughs> and with their cameras, they could see the dust go off of it. That last picture is about, about the, the distance, about the width of this room. Okay, that's how close that camera got. Now, you may be thinking, why'd you show that? Well, because something, there are things that actually transcend the world in which we live. Okay, they're, they're high. They're, they, but even though they're way out there, you may be saying, well, that's out of my world. Well, no, it's in your world. It's just in a little different neighborhood. Yeah. And the thing's high and up there, different from our usual thoughts, but they reach right down here to where we live. The reason they did that is because now they don't have to hire a well drilling outfit out of Texas to fly out there and blow up the next asteroid that threatens us. In case you haven't seen that movie, you can check it out. But it was a test. The whole point of me showing you that, it ties right into what we're saying about your souls. These things high and lifted up, these thoughts that you have. Sometimes there's thoughts that, we, there's thoughts that people bring to us that they seem disconnected, totally dif- disconnected from where I live, from my life. And yet, we need to continue the working that we're letting God do in touching our thinking, in touching our emotions, in touching our reasoning. God is opening up our hearts and our minds to new thoughts, Amen. to different things. Now, I want just how many can understand what I've said so far? And I want us to hold that thought and hold that attitude in our heart as I talk to you about what we're going to talk about in the next three weeks. Because today I'm going to talk to you about our role in governance. Now we're going to make a distinction between governance and politics. They're two different things, even though they're, they're related. And I want you to see from me, look over at, John, at Jeremiah, rather, Jeremiah chapter 9, Verse 24, because our lives as believers, our lives as Christ followers need to be based on the word of God, right? We need to be living out in faith what God says. And that means convinced in our heart of the rightness of what we're doing. Not just living without a foundation, without connectedness or on somebody else's opinion. I don't want you to do anything because of my opinion. You know, when you stand before Jesus and he says, why did you do such and such? Because Pastor Lauren told me to do it. That won't fly. Okay, whatever is not proceeded from faith, or the scripture says whatever, in other words, is not done on your part with a conviction of its rightness with God is sinful. And so today we're going to look at several scriptures as we start to lay a foundation of about God and governance and politics and our role as believers. Right here, we've sung about authority. We sang about the authority this morning. And Morgan, once again, you nailed the song selection. It was was wonderful. Don't you appreciate our praise and worship team? Can we get... Man. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 says, Let him that boasts, boast in this, that he knows me. God is speaking, that he knows me, that I am the Lord, the sovereign, the supreme, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Let's start at that point and recognize that God is high and lifted up. Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. His glory was right there. So let's start high and lifted up with the Lord, knowing the Lord. How many of you are Christian today? Believer in Jesus Christ. Well, this is our Father, the Lord, high and lifted up. And what does He do from His position in glory? He exercises something right here in the earth. What does He exercise? Loving kindness. That's a covenant love. How many have found God to be faithful to His covenant? And loving all the way through it. I mean, it's astounding to me in times in my life when I have come to him, I've blown it, I've done something, made a stupid decision, made a mistake, can come to see it and come to the Lord about it. 
the extent and fullness of his kindness changed my life. I mean, it just, amen, just expands your horizons and gives you a new vision of how we ought to live, how I ought to live. If he's that gracious and loving to me and faithful to me, man, that makes room and inspires me to be that way for other people. Amen. It's an example for me. You know, and God gives us a way forward in these things. The word gives us a way forward in, in governance and politics and as believers, exercising loving kindness. How many believe children of God ought to be like God? Okay, so that gives us a, a shines light on our path. What else? Judgment or justice, other translation would say. In other words, God doesn't just let everything slide. He makes decisions about stuff. Amen? Loving kindness and justice. Fairness for everybody. But coming to a decision. How frustrating is it when things happen in our world and nobody, especially those in a position to do something, do nothing. Do nothing. That's not the way God is. You know, he's long-suffering, but he's not just ignoring things. He exercises judgment and righteousness in the earth. He's exercising these things. He's walking these things out. He's working things, these things, right things. He always does what's right. Say it with me. God, God. always does what's right. Does what's right. So if we, someone said, well, our prayer ought not be, God, what do you want me to do? It should be more along the line of, God, what are you up to and how can I be involved? Well, if God is exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, and we want to be walking with God, that's a good direction to start. I'm going to start being, lo- being kind, being loving, being faithful, tender with people, compassionate, long-suffering. Amen. I'm going to be decisive. I'm going to be decisive with God's help, of course. I'm going to look to him and let him help me be decisive. And I'm going to do what's right. And I'm going to promote what's right. And I'm going to stand against what's wrong. I'm going to raise my voice. Do what I can to stop, put a fence or wall around stuff that's evil. And promote what's right. Where? Right here in the earth. Are you with me so far? Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 33. Another picture of our high and lifted up God who, I mean, I see that video from NASA, and I think about showing that to you guys, and I'm thinking there's, there may be somebody, what about the person that sits out there and says, yeah, they just made it up. Listen, I was in my living room, my parents' living room, watching a black and white TV when the man came off the ladder with his foot on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, and yet there's people today You say, that was just all done in a studio. And that kind of thinking controls their life. That's what I'm saying. What you have right here between your ears, between your chin and the top of your head. What you worship. These high and lifted up things are going to turn your life into a temple. That's why it's so important we let God's word straighten out our thinking. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. Say it with me. I love my pastor. Thank you. I'm so glad you, one of these days you're going to do that without me telling you. (laughs) Anyway, Isaiah 33 verse 22 says, God is three things. God is our lawgiver. God is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. If you ever wondered where our three branch government, got its inspiration, where the founders of our nation got their inspiration for our Bible-based government, which we have, it's this verse right here. These three things show us the legislative, the executive, and the other (laughs) branch of government. Come on, students, who are the other one? Executive, legislative, and judicial. Judicial judicial. Thank you. For the Lord is our judge. (laughs) Had a senior moment. I don't know why when I'm just a junior did I have a senior moment. For the Lord is our judge. 
The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Now, once again, if, if this is the way our Lord is, and these are things that he is exercising in the earth, how many of us believe that and, and can accept as reasonable at least that it makes sense for us to be doing those same things? Amen. To be, put those up there again, would you, would you please, Luke? And that's my way of saying please, would you? Uh, for the Lord is our judge. If God is working judgment, if he's a judge as his people, we ought to be cooperating with his effort. Can I get an amen? If God is our lawgiver, I may would agree with me that as his people, we ought to be cooperating with him and facilitating his efforts. Okay? Uh, after all, Jesus said, seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it would promote peace for all of us, for everybody. All things would be added to us. The Lord is our king. I may believe that we as his people should be doing what we can to submit to, cooperate with, and facilitate God's reign in the earth. Amen. Yeah. And so, Pastor, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to help you see that when it comes to governance, we are simply cooperating with the Lord. We are his agents as his people. Now, here's another verse. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Let me give you a little backstory. There was a king named Nebuchadnezzar who was pompous. He was arrogant. He thought he was God and, and claimed you know, just all kinds of pride about him. God uh, announced to him that he was about to have an experience. And what happened to him is that he went nuts. He went out of his mind and was out in the fields like an animal for seven years. His hair grew long. His nails grew long. Somebody made big bucks when they brought him in for a Manny Petty. I'm telling you. But, but, I just made that up. But he was out there. He was out there. And then seven years of that, he came to himself. His attitude was changed. He learned a lesson. He went through an experience and he learned a lesson. Talk about things high and lifted up. Look at the wording of Daniel 4, 17. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. This word, this decree is by the watchers. That sounds sci-fi to me. Doesn't that sound sci-fi to you? The watchers. Now, maybe you're not old enough. I was a Trekkie. Okay, the original is the best. Okay, the, the watchers. What are these watchers? They are a class of angelic beings who are viewing everything that's going on. And they put out a decree from God about what is going to happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then he went through it. And why did he experience this? What was the lesson that he should learn? How many think we ought to learn from his experience? We don't have time to do it all ourselves. You know, like someone said, let's learn from one another's mistakes. We don't have time to make them all ourselves. So let's learn from Nebuchadnezzar's experience. What did he have to learn by going through this? For seven years. Look what it says. It, it says that, that God, high and lifted up, transcendent, rules in the governments of human beings. This is how the Amplified translation. Rules in the governments of human beings and. Here's what I want you to catch as I read the rest of We look at the rest of this verse. I want to see, yes, God is high and lifted up. But what he does comes right down where we live. But I want us to understand how that happens. And that it happens through you and I. That God rules in the kingdoms of men, but he administrates that rule. It shows up through our hands, our feet, our thoughts, our words, our actions. He rules in the heavens, but he's given the earth to us. We are his hands. Hold your hands out in front of you. Say to them, these are God's hands. 
It's our whole body. Look down at your feet. These are God's feet. We're his body, right? We're the body of Christ. We are the present physical presence of Christ in the earth. The body of Christ, the church. We are the present physical presence. The present physical presence of Christ in the earth. Look at this verse. This was the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, quite a lesson. I mean, an object lesson for sure. What did he learn? The most high rules in the kingdoms of men. Secondly, he bestows it on whoever, whomever he desires. And thirdly, he sets over it the humblest and lowliest of people. God selects people to rule, to govern, to administrate. But he doesn't, he doesn't, being cocky, running into the end zone and say, you know, worship me, worship me. Get on my blog, buy my shirt. That's a sure way to get God thinking about turning away from you. Or moving towards you to help you out of that stupidity. Because he wants to use every single one of us. He rules in the kingdoms of men. Are you with me still? He gives it to whoever he wills. Bestows it on them. See, our, our leaders are ministers of God. Just as surely as I'm speaking for him, endeavoring to do my best simply to give utterance by his spirit to his word for your hearts. Those who stand in offices of government are his ministers who are to do their best to simply yield to him. So that their words are his words. His thoughts get carried out through their activities. tell you to be a candidate for the blessing of God is a little bit different than being a political candidate. Amen. But the two ought to be the same. Yeah. So that we have not just politicians but statesmen who are out there for the kingdom of God and the public good. Can I get an amen? amen. Now God is watching over our souls and we're opening up our minds to new thoughts. See, where you sit, you might not feel the pressures I feel. The continuum on one end, people say this ought not be talked about in church. And the people on the other end that, that say, Pastor, you're not being aggressive enough. And I realize everybody's got their perspective. And I put my big belly pants on and do what I need to do. But my role is to watch out for your souls. And one of the most difficult things in the world is for people to stay in the middle of the road. And my concern as I talk about this, here's the goal. Here's the question is, how can I talk about these things? How can we handle ourselves and our actions during this election season? That will empower our witness for Christ when the season is over. Amen. Because the reality is there's people living today not in, a not in a democratic republic but under dictatorships. People living, Christians living under socialism. Christians living under barbarians. We have the privilege of living where we live. But the kingdom of God... There, how many of you believe those people living under those adverse governments should put the kingdom of God first? Well, how many of them believe we also, as living in the United States of America, should also put the kingdom of God first? So regardless how the election turns out, here's a statement that you have an opportunity to stumble over. I hope you won't. Regardless of how the election turns out, I'm going to keep serving Jesus. Are you with me? And yet at the same time, to say that is not to say that I'm surrendering to whatever will be, will be. 
Because God has established governance. Now, what do we mean by governance? See, some people say that Christians should stay above politics. Well, let's just go on. What is governance? Governance is defined as the act or manner of governing. Now, do you know any more than you did before? That's something, I mean, red means red. Blue means blue. What's governing? Let's just say it this way. God has, a, has given somebody authority to govern. In other words, to conduct the policy, actions, and affairs of a state, organization, or people. God gives somebody authority to govern the affairs. Give somebody authority to govern. Now think about it. In a state, in an organization, in a family. God gives somebody authority in a family to govern. Can I get an amen? Amen. Ephesians 6, 4. I'm going to just give you some references so you can go look them up. Again, God's word is alive and powerful. God's word is what cuts asunder out of our souls things that shouldn't be there. Amen? It's God's word that feeds our spirit. Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God gives parents authority. Matter of fact, in 1, Thessalonians, or 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, we learn that when we're looking for a leader in the church, the people that are qualified are those that know how to rule their own house. Then it goes on in a negative way to say, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Can you see governance in that? Not politics, but governance. Governance. Secondly, God gives people in a church authority to govern. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says there even is a spiritual gift of governing Spiritual gift of governing. In 1 Corinthians 14, 40, we're told in a church service, do everything, let everything be done decently and in order. That means that someone is responsible. Matter of fact, we're told other places to withdraw from those who walk disorderly. All these verses speak of governance, of someone having authority to direct the affairs. In a society, Romans 13 would say this, verse 4 and 5, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for, any, for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of, God's, because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This was huge for me growing up in a pacifist church. Knowing from 1 John chapter 4 that perfect love casts out fear. Romans 13 goes on and says, if you do that which is evil, be afraid. This is the same God that said, I am love. Same God that exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. Same God that said, perfect love casts out fear, said, be afraid if you do what is evil. And the streets of Chicago and our other cities are running wild because those who are ministers of God are not standing up and putting a stop on evil and defending the rights of the good. When they need to be God's ministers. They are God's ministers. They are God's ministers. And if, if, if what I've just said in the last 60 seconds is an issue for your thinking or your conscience, because it was for mine, I want to encourage you to let God minister these things out of Romans 13 to your heart. What they're saying is that it's not my personal right to go to a place where evil is running rampant. And it, it's not, I'm not a policeman in Chicago. I'm not a military guy here. So I don't have that same authority. I've got the authority to pastor. 
That's my calling. That's my anointing. But there are those who have the calling and the anointing and the authority to put a fence around evil and to protect the rest of us. And I can tell you, years ago, one of our teenagers in the church, his friends, so-called, gathered around him, proceeded to beat him up, broke his arm. He was told to forgive them. What he needed was a father-like figure to step in and fight for his cause and tell his heart this was wrong and to make sure justice was carried out. That didn't happen for him. He's ended up wrestling with identity things, alcoholism. I'm telling you, God is a God that exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. And when things are not taken care of, bad things are let loose. And we cry out to God sometimes, God, when are you going to do something? Do I need to have you look again at your feet? At your hands? O body of Christ? The body of God will do something when his body gets on the move. He desires to. He delights in these things. Are you still with me? God has even established that we govern ourselves. In Proverbs 25, 28, we read, Like a city breached without walls is one who lacks self-control. In, the, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, we read that God has given us a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So there's governance. Are you with me so far? So God has established governance. Well, what about politics? What in the world is politics? Pastor, don't use dirty words like that. I mean, that just shows how how a lot of people think. But politics, by definition, is the art or science concerned with guiding or influencing governmental policy. It's the art or science concerned with winning and holding control over a government. That's politics. Politics involves coalitions. Politics involves conversations and bargaining, and negotiations. Politics involves the conflict over competing interests and how those things work and, and are carried out. Because Politics involves the, 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 the conflict, the struggle, the competition for power and scarce resources and standing and, and control of where things go. That's politics. I thank God for politicians. A lot of us ought to thank God for politicians so we don't, and be glad that we don't have to be them. Because dealing with people that would just assume you be dead or don't value your ideals, the whole thing, the things that you hold dear, the things you believe to be true. And yet to stand and fight for what's right, I think they're to be commended and encouraged and prayed for and supported. Hallelujah. There are representatives. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, one person said, politics is a strife of interest masquerading as a contest of principles. That's kind of cynical. And a lot of people would say, or it's tempting for Christians to stay above politics and out of the fray. But in this day of cancel cancel culture and 24-7 news coverage and a nation that feels more divided and divisive than ever, it's understandable for good people to want to stay on the sidelines. That's understandable. But the Bible gives us three points for going forward. And if we were on a flight right now, the ding would happen on the intercom and say, we've begun our descent. Put your tray tables up and stow your reading materials. You know, in other words, in conclusion, but it's going to take me a few minutes. Three things the Bible gives us for going forward. Now, I want you to understand, as we start this today, Over the next couple weeks, 
uh, we'll, we'll be digging into this more. First of all, God calls three points from the Bible for going forward. Number one, God calls and uses political leaders. Can I get a louder amen? amen. Like one preacher said, can a brother get a better amen than that? The Bible makes it clear that despite the stigma of politics, the this, this stigma often associated with politics, God calls and uses political leaders. Right. Those of you that are familiar somewhat with your Bible may remember the, the well, let's just say it this way. God uses those who partner with him. Amen. Okay? Like Joseph, whose brother sold him into slavery, and he ended up being second in command in Egypt. God uses those who partner with him. Like Mordecai in the book of Esther, who was dressed in royal robes and given great authority in Persia. Or like Daniel, who was a captive in Babylon. And because of his obedience and trust in God, he was led to rule the entire province. So God uses those that cooperate with him. But God, here's a second sub point. God can use people who don't cooperate. Amen. Like Pharaoh, who kept saying no when God said, let my people go. It wasn't that Pharaoh didn't know what God's will was. And so what did God do when Pharaoh chose to harden his heart? God just reminded me of, uh, God just put him through a test like in the foundry at John Deere and just hardened the part. Just hardened it, hardened it to the point where God's people got let go. So God uses people that cooperate with him. God can use people who don't cooperate with him without their agreement even, but it's better. Can you all say it's better? It's better for godly people to be leading. What's it got a Bible verse for that? Yeah, the word of God. Yeah, Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2. This is how the Amplified Classic Version when the uncompromisingly righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan and sigh. So God can and does use political leaders. Can I get an amen? Secondly, God calls us to participate in politics. I can't say it any more plain than that. Why don't you say it with me if you can? God calls us to participate in politics. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Are you hearing me, church? Say it with me. That means me. And as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the flourishing of the world is is, in part, our responsibility. That's right. I'm going to say it again. As the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the flourishing of the world is our responsibility. That's right. Amen. I'm going to say it again. As the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the flourishing of the world is our responsibility. See, if I'm in a dark room and I'm the only one with a light, it's my responsibility to turn on the light. Or else the darkness is my fault. There was a traveling music group that, that went from church to church, young college age kids, church to church. I, I, I remember being that age. Man, I'm Fire, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to preach. I want to do all these things. This group, but they would take turns as they were visiting churches. They would sing, and one from the group would bring the message in the morning. Well, one young man, it was his turn, and he came up, and he preached fire. Oh, fire, fire, probably fire and brimstone. I mean, he pointed out everything wrong, and he just he thought he did a great job. He's just feeling real good about himself, and he got into the touring bus, and well, they're getting ready to leave. And before they pulled out, the pastor of the church came up to him in the bus. And said, where's that young man that brought the message today? Said, yep, you know, 
you know, and the pastor came up to him. He's ready, he's ready to get a good attaboy, you know. And the pastor looked at him and says, son, he said, don't kick the darkness. Turn on the light. Amen. We've got the light of the world in us, right? And there's opportunities all the time to grumble, gripe. We could use other words and complain about what's going on. Let's be those who turn on the light. Let's look to our brilliant God to give us ideas and steps and actions. Can I get an amen? Here's the other thought. God calls us to participate in politics. Caring for our culture and engaging in its political processes is part of good citizenship for God's people. Caring for our culture. See, being a Christian is more than coming to church, more than having a relationship, just me and Jesus. We got a good thing going. It's got to get outside these walls and make a difference in our lives because we care about other people and be an influence. We're here for a purpose. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, the Bible says that God made out of one blood all people to live on the place of the earth, out of, out of one race. Listen, friend, I don't care what color, you, it does not matter what color your skin is, we are one race. Amen. Made from one blood. Amen. We are one people. And God determined when we live and where we live. So you're here today because of God. These are your good old days. The Bible calls them perilous times. I call them wild and woolly. But you know what? If God Almighty put you, decided you were going to live and overcome and be victorious and be an influence and have an impact in these wild and woolly times, then you are a wild and woolly person. Amen. 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 So let that touch your soul. Amen. Jeremiah 29, verse 7. The Israelites were taken captive into Babylon. And God told them, work for the good of the city where I've sent you. For in, seek the good of the city where I've sent you. For in its welfare will be your welfare. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And it's our responsibility to seek the good of our city and our nation. So how can you do it? Number one, vote. Vote. It's our responsibility to be informed voters, to seek God's leadership, to vote and encourage others to do the same. Secondly, engage. Your elected officials need to hear from you. They want to hear from you. I can tell you personally, one letter from you that, that's, that is not just a, a forwarded email, a form letter, one personal letter, one personal phone call from you is huge in the hearts and minds of your leaders. It's huge. You have an influence. Don't ever believe the lie that what you think doesn't matter. Don't ever believe the lie that, that your voice doesn't matter. It's huge. Use it. Amen. Use it. Thirdly, serve. Serve. We need voters of faith, and we need leaders of faith. Amen? We need people connected to Almighty God who hear from Him and will do His will for us. Can I get an amen? amen. So I just want to ask you, is God calling you to elected office. You know, are you asking him to make his desires known to you and to others? And then finally, intercede, pray. We're to pray for our leaders. Can I get an amen? amen? We're to pray for our leaders, whether we agree with them or not. Matter of fact, if we disagree with them, we probably ought to be even more moved to prayer. Why? Because we're putting up a fence. We're pushing back the darkness. We're advancing the kingdom. Amen? Pray for them. Do you even know, do you know their name? Do you know the name of your city council people? Do you know the name? And I realize I'm standing in Iowa, but I'm ministering to Badgers and Illini, as well as Hawkeyes and Cyclones and Dewhawks. And now I'll be in trouble for not naming your team. But you know what I mean. We're in a trice. Do you know the name 
of your common council members? Do you know the name of your mayor to pray for them? Can I get an amen? Are you praying for your president and the cabinet? Let's lift our voice. We make tremendous power available. Dynamic and it's working. Then finally, so number one, God calls and uses political leaders. Number two, God calls us to participate. Number three, serve our highest authority. First Peter chapter two, verse 17. Peter said, fear God and honor the king. You could say president, emperor, but I want you to notice something. He says, honor the emperor, but fear God. In our country, there's not many times that we're put in a position where we have to choose who we're going to serve. But pushed, let us be among our brothers that said, we must obey God rather than men. It's God that ordains our leaders. Now listen, vote, ultimately voting in the United States is the privilege and responsibility of every eligible citizen. Christians must never think they get a pass on that because what we have is clear guidance from God's word why and how to participate in our democratic republic. Can I get an amen? I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. We have the privilege of being in this country. We have the privilege of being in children of God We know that there's a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties. We know in the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned, he brought sin and death into the world. But we also know that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever believes on him won't perish, but will have everlasting life. You may be like I was. You may believe everything I've said about Jesus this morning, and yet you have never trusted him to be your savior. That's the big deal, is to realize that none of us can get right with God on our own. And that's why God sent Jesus. And he did everything necessary and gave it to you as a gift for you to become a child of God. All the forgiveness, all the purpose, everything God's laid up for you can become yours just by calling on the name of Jesus. We're going to pray a prayer in just a moment. I'd like to know I'm praying with you. This is an opportunity for you to trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. It's a gift. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. We're just all going to pray together. But I'd like to know I'm praying with you. So if you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm praying. I'm receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior this morning. On the count of three, would you raise your hand and slip it back down just so I see it? God sees it. One, two, three. Go ahead and slip up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, church, let's pray together. Just everybody say it with me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for what you did for me by sending Jesus. Right now, Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior. Thank you for receiving me as one of your own. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a couple things that I would like you to do. Hit the subscribe button, rate, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to invest in helping us reach more people for Christ, head over to mywordoflife.church and click the online giving button. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.